Morning, everyone. Welcome to the Gen Research Annual Meeting. Um, this is uh, going to be a, a very action-packed and interactive session. Uh, you know, we want to use this time to brainstorm and uh, develop ideas about how we build the, the network and uh, continue uh, collaboration and coordination year-round uh, around a few key topics that, uh, of interest. Um, delighted to be joined by so many of the, the research uh, members, uh, both kind of uh, new and old. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we, we won't kind of do a, a round table uh, just asking everyone who they are, but, you know, if you, if you are pre-registered, you've got, got access to the uh, Google document with the attendee list, and I think, as you can see, a phenomenal range of, uh, of individuals, experts from around the world uh, that are here today. Um, <clears throat> like to... Uh, hand over to uh, President, uh, Founder, Global Entrepreneurship Network, Jonathan Altmans, uh, to give some opening words uh, on kind of the, the background and the history of the, the GEN research uh, program and our, our uh, research community. Jonathan. Thanks, Matt. And thanks to you and Tom for your leadership in pulling all this together. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, take a few minutes at the beginning just to sort of put in context. Some of you may have been with us at the Gen Research meeting in Riyadh, and uh, I think, uh, Ted, it was much smaller than this. Um, and uh, one of the things that we have recognized that happened in the field uh, of uh, entrepreneurship research uh, is that for a period of you know, the last few years, we've actually seen a dwindling level of activity uh, compared to where we were um, uh, five or six years ago. I'm not talking about Jen, I'm just talking about generally speaking in terms of the attention given by um, institutions to uh, both funding and driving uh, the sort of intellectual backbone of what's informing uh, entrepreneurship and innovation uh, policy and programming. And so um, we have been very, very keen to build this and I want to pay special thanks to the likes of uh, Chris Haley and uh, Ted Zoller, Dane Stangler, um, and so many new voices <clears throat> that are coming on board uh, to be able to help us, um, uh, shall I say, uh, put forward a new generation of, um, uh, of, of uh, research work uh, around entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, and um, I, I think one point to note is that obviously we have now a growing community of thinkers uh, and analysts and, and uh, data experts and academics who are um, uh, working with us. Um, uh, this is a smaller group of those people because uh, you represent the people that were able to get on an airplane and join us today, and we're very, very appreciative. But I want to stress that um, whether it's the OECD or the World Bank, uh, whether it's some of the private institutions like I know we I see Hugo's here from Podum, for example, whether it's the work we do with Startup Genome, uh, or a variety of other institutions that we are engaging in research projects with, uh, we are also uh, uh, growing and expanding the number of partnerships we have uh, with people who are smarter than we are to figure out um, how we address some of these issues. So these kinds of conversations drive uh, the strategy of what we were doing collectively together, but a, a couple of quick things to observe first. Gen Research does have a clearly defined and written uh, strategic and operational goal of, and, 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 and um, uh, fortunately some funding from the Coffin Foundation uh, to be able to advance our strategy. Uh, we've got that over, over a we have a three-year strategic plan. Um, and we do have a variety of things that we've started to roll out, whether it be with a partner, like you announced or yesterday I announced that we'll be doing a, a new scale-up report with Startup Genome. Uh, or whether it be things that we're doing uh, in-house directly with our team through the great work you've heard about and we'll hear about again um, from Tom uh, on things like our Gen Atlas, which we consider to be um, a, a recipe to help policymakers who all tell me, I'm going to fly around the world, meet people and find out what they're doing. And if only someone could actually do that for me and could somehow document that in a consistent way, uh, that would allow me to uh, take a look at what's been the results and the impact of interventions done by policymakers, just as one example. Uh, and so that's one of the things that we are uh, we're, we're doing. There will be a variety of other things that uh, uh, Matt and Tom uh, will brief you on uh, that we're, we're under, undergoing, but perhaps the most important thing we can do while we're face-to-face -face and we're meeting 3D rather than on Zoom 
is to make sure that we you have a chance to articulate your thoughts. Those thoughts could be related to uh, uh, what you're specifically doing. We're always interested in learning your thinking about uh, what your organizations uh, have been motivated to uh, fund you either as an individual researcher or as an institution uh, in this field. Uh, but we're also interested in your thoughts, as always, about where we should be concentrating our new efforts. Um, I would point out that there are uh, a variety of institutions present at this Congress, including the likes of uh, MIT REAP program, thanks for joining us, uh, also the likes of the Coffin Foundation, uh, and a variety of others who are uh, capitalizing and translating this research into practical, um, actionable uh, advice and guidance uh, to the practitioners of our community. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, uh, you have to be the um, guiding uh, force around ensuring that what we're doing is, is obviously, uh, as they say, first rule, do no harm. Uh, what we're doing is actually taking us in the right direction. And we've outlined some very, very big challenges uh, over the course of the last couple of days that the global ecosystem faces. And we hope that as researchers, you'll continue to make sure that you're investing your time and energy on subjects that we think will help us move in the right direction. I also finally want to pay special tribute to the winner of our Gen Research Award last night, Dr. Chad Renendo. Um, Chad is just uh, doing tremendous work uh, and is an example to us all about what you can do uh, at the national level, uh, but also has been, I think, an inspiration to a lot of us. So thank you again, Chad, for, for all you're doing on the research side. So. <clears throat> So without further ado, I will turn back over to you and um, uh, very much look forward to uh, listening to all of you. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, delighted to be joined by Ted Zoller, uh, one of the uh, leading academics in entrepreneurship and uh, you know, somebody who's given phenomenally strong support to help us uh, with the, the Gen Research Program, the relaunch of Atlas, uh, and has really helped structure a lot of today and the wider thinking around uh, getting the research community back up and running uh, after a bit of a pause. So, Ted, um, would love to hand over to you to uh, get your thoughts and insights on where you see the opportunities for the research network, what you'd like to achieve from today, um, and uh, a brief outline of the format going forward for the rest of the session. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm Ted Zollner at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and been engaged in kind of this uh, middle ground between the policy community and the research community. And I think one of the key lessons that Matt and Jonathan and I heard last year uh, at our uh, event in Riyadh is that there's a paucity of connections between the policy and research community. And what kind of role could we play as part of the uh, Global Entrepreneurship Research Network to help bring that or build that bridge uh, between policymakers and researchers? And uh, the people that are around the table are all people that are uh, engaged in the practice, as well as uh, steeped in uh, understanding the empirics and ultimately the uh, insights that are driven and that are actionable out of research. So uh, I want to celebrate um, the researchers that are around us because these are the folks that are actually putting their uh, theory to work. Um, we have to build uh, critical bridges between those two categories. So uh, last year also, we felt like we needed to codify Kind of where we are by way of policy uh, that is informed by research. And uh, Tom Hancock uh, was willing, under the uh, su support and, and uh, oversight that Matt provided, to uh, really give us a baseline, uh, completely uh, updating and, I would argue, reconstructing the Gen Atlas, which now is an extraordinary resource um, for both policymakers and researchers. The uh, value proposition of the policymaker uh, is that they can see other examples from around the world where research is informing policy and those policies can be translated. And we see the power of that uh, on a regular basis uh, when there's an innovation in one country that then finds its way around the world. For instance, uh, what happened with Startup Chile would be an example how a little country like Chile could actually, um, for a while, uh, really capture everyone's imagination. Yet there was really no research behind it. And the way it was implemented was um, you know, somewhat haphazard. Um, I want to credit my friend, Dane Stangler, because he spent uh, a lot of his career thinking about these bridges and continues to think about these bridges. And I just want to thank him for you know, giving us kind of the framework uh, in how we approach this work. 
So um, briefly, uh, our agenda for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to ask Tom to update us on his work with the Atlas and how it would serve as a resource to both policymakers and researchers. And then we've invited three top-notch folks. Um, uh, Jonathan has already celebrated Chad, and Chad actually inspires us all uh, with the work that he's done on ecosystems and now um, driving, uh, I think, the newest frontier in knowledge on how uh, data can be organized so that um, policymakers can make informed decisions on supporting a vibrant, on, uh, vibrant high-performing uh, economy. Uh, so he will be our first discussant in one of three areas. The first area is ecosystem mapping and performance. That was recognized in Riyadh as one of our key areas that's in the frontier. The second area is in acceleration and incubation. Uh, a lot has been done in the research community to um, understand which models are efficacious, which models maybe are uh, unhelpful in the area of acceleration. And there's a lot of resource being spent in that area, so it's another fruitful area for us to discuss. And then the third area, which is probably one of the most important areas, is inclusive entrepreneurship. How do you bring everyone to the table uh, in order to encourage uh, a fuller economic prosperity? So in the ecosystem map mapping, we're going to start with Chad. In the acceleration area, um, Chris Haley from the World Bank is going to be our discussant. And then inclusive entrepreneurship, I'm, I'm thrilled to have Philip Gaskin here. Philip has done some of the most important work in economic mobility, and I'm quite excited to um, have him join us. So um, we're going to take basically five-ish minutes for each discussant to outline their views on the state of play in that area and the degree to which research is organized behind that area so that we can identify a target. What are we aiming at? What are we looking to rectify? Uh, after those three 10-minute periods of time, we're going to break up. And in our respective areas of interest, we're going to break into working groups. And uh, the discussants will lead those discussions and then report that information back to um, Matt. So is everyone clear on the agenda? If you don't have the agenda, go ahead and bring it up. Uh, on your uh, invitation package, and uh, we will uh, conclude right at 12. So I'm going to turn it over first. Matt, I don't know if you'd like to interrupt, but uh, Tom Hancock uh, has been uh, leading the Jenny Atlas and once and is going to update us now on his work. Thank you so much, Tom. Uh, thank you, Ted and Matt. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I think I've met quite a lot of you in this room already, this conference, uh, but for those of you who I haven't. Uh, as has been mentioned, I'm Jen's research associate, where I support really the work that Matt does, both in policy and research. Uh, mostly, though, I've spent the last six months uh, squirreled away, working to churn out as many Atlas articles as I can to, and in, to improve the overall functionality of the platform. And it's tremendously exciting for me, at least, that I can uh, actually finally share some of what I'm doing with everyone else. Um, but more importantly, in almost every country, region, and city in the world, there are political leaders and groups of policymakers striving to spread opportunity and elevate the fortunes of their economies through entrepreneurship. And through Atlas, Jen wants to make that mission just a little bit easier. We know that in some parts of the globe, they have distinguished histories promoting entrepreneurship, but many others lack that institutional knowledge and look to others for best practice and effective policymaking. Um, and that's why this GEC, we've announced the launch of the new improved Gen Atlas, which is the largest knowledge portal of its kind, with 339 entries from more than 70 countries. Uh, and it's drawn really from our extensive network of knowledge partners, advisors, policymakers, researchers, and academics. So if the mayor of Lyon develops, say, an innovative microgrants program, we want policymakers from Bangkok to Bratislava to be able to quickly digest the key aspects of the policy and start to consider whether it can be replicated locally. And we're delighted to share with you that the new version of Atlas in particular has over 100 bits of new and updated content available to anyone interested in finding the most innovative entrepreneurship policies across the world. This is a mission that we think Jen's research community is uniquely placed to grasp. Um, but when we started consulting the research and policy community about Atlas in its previous form, you came to us with several important insights and critiques. Firstly, you found it 
quite difficult to pull up relevant case studies, even though we had quite a lot of content, due to the lack of keyword search functionality and a categorization system that didn't really allow you to filter by program type and felt kind of di disconnected from the real issues facing policymakers. Secondly, there was a massive variety in the quality of case studies in terms of readability, structure and length and, write, and a writing style kind of more suited for academia than the policy world. Um, and finally, many case studies lacked critical pieces of information such as program cost uh, and objective analysis of the program's impact. Um, and we've listened to this feedback keenly and we've developed Atlas in a way to meet these challenges. Um, so firstly, the search functionality of the site has been transformed uh, with a beefed up list of eight high level policy themes, over 100 different policy mechanisms, keyword search functionality and the ability to filter by the cost of programs and the level of evidence that they provide for impact. This will allow you as researchers to identify the most interesting and relevant policies for your work in a simple and logical way. We've also worked to make the content on Atlas much more consistent in style and substance in order to make it easier for policymakers to compare policies that target a similar problem. So each case study is built around six quite simple questions. The first being, what were the aims and objectives of the program? Secondly, how does the program work? Thirdly, how much does it cost? Fourthly, how was the program developed and implemented? Fifthly, what impact has the program had? And finally, what lessons can be learned from it? Um, and clearly, one of the, the key bits of information that both policymakers and researchers are going to want to be able to access is the level of impact that these programs are having. Historically, this information has been inconsistent on Atlas. Some entries have detailed impact studies, others just have participation figures, and others, again, have nothing at all. Partly, this reflects large variations in how much assessment is actually conducted by the programs themselves. But what we want to achieve is a more systematic way to capture this and point out gaps in evidence where they exist. So we've introduced a new rating system to judge how much evidence has been provided by each program. Starting at level one, there's participation and activity. At the very least, policymakers should track how many entrepreneurs or startups have participated in their program or benefited from the policy. Secondly, um, the level above, we're looking at outcomes. So policymakers quite often have evidence that they've hit specific goals that they've set themselves, such as number of course graduates going on to start a business, or number of products successfully developed, or number of relocations. Above that, we have wider economic impact at level three, where policymakers may cite economic stats relating to their program, such as increased investment, GVA, job creation, survival rates, business creation, or increased exports. However, they will not make level four unless they can prove directly that their policy is responsible through either a control group or some other academic method. Uh, and you'll now critically be able to search the platform by each of these levels to find the policies and how much evidence that they've provided. And by our measure, Atlas is already the world's largest database of entrepreneurship case studies, but we want to go much further than that and make it an indispensable tool of the policymaking process all around the world at all levels of government. Um, so just to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do next with it. To achieve this, Atlas will be producing weekly content that provides high levels of insight. These insights will be structured around three themes, which are firstly policy deep dives that cross-examine similar policies and explore the differences in approach and the outcomes from this. So the first of these that will be released on Friday, uh, tomorrow, uh, will examine nine different startup acts. Um, secondly, we have country deep dives that analyze the policies available in a specific nation around the, key, the eight key themes that we've identified and drawing out innovative ideas and identifying gaps in provision. The first of these series will look at Australia and will be released next week. Finally, we'll be doing the Atlas Spotlight series, which identifies individual interesting case studies for a variety of reasons, including innovative approaches to assessing impact or implementation. Um, and besides this, in the coming months, we plan to build a policymaker's toolkit based on the 110 different types of policies we've identified, tying each policy to a high quality Atlas entry. We want to expand the number of countries featured in Atlas to 100, especially expanding into Africa and Asia. We want to focus more on policies that city and state governments can easily adopt by expanding the number of entries that look at devolved levels of government. And finally, we want to work to recruit trusted new Atlas authors by utilizing the Gen Research and Policy Networks with the ultimate goal of creating more content written by experts. 
And this point leads me on to the, uh, what I would call the ask not what Atlas can do for you, but what can you do for Atlas portion of the presentation. Um, so firstly, we are looking for experts in a particular area to adopt the policies, sort of policy theme that's relevant to them. So for example, you could adopt a policy theme such as visa schemes or micro grants to name just a couple. If you're interested in seeing a full list of the policy areas um, that we're exploring, please let me know and I'll distribute that to you. Uh, secondly, you can actually write a new entry yourself. Uh, we're going to distribute the new template and tone of voice guide to everyone in attendance. Thirdly, you can suggest topics that you think we've missed or that would add genuine value to the Atlas platform. And just to be clear here, we're not attempting to create a, a new entry for, say, every accelerator program in the world and every ecosystem. Rather, we want innovative examples that stand out from the pack, whether that's due to creative policy design, impressive impact assessment, or intriguing lessons learned. Fourthly, you can direct resources to us. It might be that you're familiar with a great policy, but you lack the time to write an entry. Uh, in that case, any information you can provide for us about programmatic cost or impact assessments would be extremely well appreciated in particular. And also, you can connect us with potential contributors when you come across them. Fifthly, we hope that everyone in this room will spread the word about Atlas and promote the, the potential of this platform to their communities. And finally, we would like you to tell us how to improve the platform still further. We know that many of you in this room have been responsible for similar projects, and we place a real premium on your thoughts and advice. So if you have any thoughts, uh, I'd love to chat about it over coffee, um, so just let me know. But, um, thank you very much for being here. I think we have to do better than that. I think, you know, I'm kind of embarrassed because I didn't bring an honorary doctorate uh, for Tom, but he's a, 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 basically a, has accomplished that much effort. Let's give Tom a real round of applause. <laughs> As the old adage says, uh, academics will work for money, but they'll kill for data. And uh, you know, the truth of the matter is this will inspire not only policymakers to learn from one another, but uh, academics to um, start to do uh, platform formation and, and, and questions that are uh, going to drive additional data. And that's one of the key topics of our next segment. Any questions for Tom before we move on? Thank you, Tom. That was extraordinary. Great way to start us. I want to add one other thing uh, to fuel the idea about some of these, uh, which topics we should be doing. Uh, Matt is also um, uh, every day monitoring all of the global sources and press to find innovative policy work happening that we didn't know about. Uh, and publishes, uh, I think every Friday or every other Friday, uh, something called Startup Nation. We can't send it to you unless you ask for it for GDPR reasons. So um, if you're interested in it, please do sign up for it. You'll find it, you know, the five, six, five or six quick reads. Uh, but you, it also might stimulate some feedback for Tom uh, about areas where maybe we haven't uh, sufficiently started to cover that in the Atlas. So thank you very much indeed. Tom has provided us a springboard. Uh, and last year, we were not, uh, we did not have availability to that springboard. So the number of questions that uh, are going to be generated uh, from the work uh, in the Atlas is formidable. Uh, but last year in Riyadh, uh, the group assembled identified three areas uh, of great interest. Um, obviously, there's a lot of focus on ecosystem mapping and performance, uh, looking at the structure of ecosystems. The second area is how do we uh, support a growth orientation in our venturing community uh, in the area of incubation and acceleration. And the third area is how do we bring everyone to the table uh, in all dimensions of entrepreneurship with inclusion. Um, these were the three topics we selected last year. Uh, given Tom's work, we'll obviously be uh, looking at a wider range. Um, but I'd ask everyone to put themselves to work for a moment. We're asking uh, three experts to give more or less a state of the field kind of uh, commentary, uh, where things stand by way of uh, the state of the art today and the degree to which research is forming around that area. That's what I'm gonna ask each uh, respondent to uh, discuss and to offer. But I'd ask during those presentations, if you all could be thinking as to ways we can enhance that bridge and other questions that are important for us to be uh, identifying in that particular area so that when we break up, uh, it would be a rich, albeit short, conversation. Um, is everyone clear on that? The two prompts would be, 
uh, what bridge exists between uh, research and policy in that particular area, and how do we uh, increase the, the, the quality of that bridge? And then the second question is, what other questions need to be addressed in that particular area? It gives us a future agenda. Okay, so uh, moving forward, uh, Chad is going to open up uh, in the area of ecosystem mapping and performance, and thank you, Chad, for uh, giving us your view on the field. Excellent. Thank, thank you. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, definitely a, a privilege and honor to be here. Uh, I would like to open up with um, uh, probably a, a, a piece of literature that to me describes a process I've personally gone through in uh, ecosystem mapping uh, entitled, if, if You Give a Mouse a Cookie. And the, this academic uh, uh, thesis goes something to the fact that if you give a mouse a cookie, he's going to ask for a, a glass of milk. And if you give him a glass of milk, he's going to ask for a straw. And if you give him a straw, and as the book goes on, it could, turns into a napkin and then eventually a refrigerator. Um, and in the version I know in my personal life, it turns into a morgue in an entire city, although the, the mouse does go back to eventually getting a glass of milk. And that is a bit like ecosystem mapping, where you, know, you start in one point and you end up someplace else and you go someplace else. And quite often you can find out you're just right back where you started from. Um, so it is a, a encouraging to see the literature kind of come through and, and define a bit of the field that we're going into. I want to touch on five points in the brief time that we have. First thing is when we when we look at ecosystem mapping to encourage a, a curiosity. Two different approaches that we can see with ecosystem mapping is a is what you know referred to as a grounded theory approach, a bottom up, and you go in there just with a complete open, ignoring all literature and saying, what am I seeing? What are we actually looking at? And I personally. View, I use a, an approach called critical realism where there's three points of truth, right? You go into a situation, you say, what does the data show? What are we seeing from actual statistics and numbers and, and, and research and previous literature? The second one is what am I actually seeing? You know, when you go into a community and you look around and, and what are the functions that are happening? And the third one, though, is people's lived experience. And when we do ecosystem mapping, you look and you treat all of those three as absolute because quite often you can go into a region and, and, the, and the map will say, here's what's happening and here's all the, the incubators and the, and the universities and the government by definition. But then yet what you're actually seeing is you're seeing something doesn't look right. And, and the map says this is supposed to be happening, but these people are performing this over here. But then you actually go into a region and they say, look, mate, let me tell you what's really happening. And so as we're doing the mapping, what we do is we break it down. Um, there's another theory that we use called actor network theory, which basically says everything's an actor and it does things interacting with other actors. And so you look at the functions and their roles. And as I was saying in a panel yesterday, uh, when you look at, for example, innovation hubs, there's no such thing as an innovation hub. It doesn't exist in absolute. It's not like this table. I can say table and we can say, great, it's got a hard top. I can feel it. I can touch it. An innovation hub is just a collection of functions that we put together into a construct and we say, we all agree that's an innovation hub. But what we're seeing over time is that the functions that were performed in an innovation hub are starting to split out. You know, corporations are starting to take some of those high value functions and leaving some of the low value things. So the innovation hub doesn't actually look like what I thought an innovation hub was maybe two or three years ago. So when we map, the danger is, is that we put that map in place and that becomes reality. But then five, 10 years later, after that map was published, you go to the community and they say, that's not, oh, we don't even look at that anymore. That doesn't happen. So the first thing is encourage curiosity in a systems perspective when we're doing the mapping. The second point I want to say is that said, there are definitions in a taxonomy. We do need to say there is such a thing as an innovation hub, and this is what we call it, even while we would be curious and ongoing as we move forward. So we do have to have a bit of a taxonomy that we provide a framing because it is complex and we need to give some definitions around it. The third thing we'll point to then is what are the boundaries around the map that we're talking about? We need to have some sort of scope. Um, quite often we use the word ecosystem, you know, from its original uh, construct in the 1930s with ecology, which then morphed into talking about social systems as a descriptor. Um, but the word that comes before it is very important. And quite often they get mixed up. I'm very intentional when I say innovation, Ecosystem. Innovation being very simply something new that adds value to a group of people and the system by which that happens. You could have an entrepreneur ecosystem, which is a common construct around everything helping the entrepreneur, which is a simply somebody that puts in their own risk and has a potential for value and has ownership. We could have a business ecosystem. And then we start adding more words in front. 
the indigenous entrepreneur ecosystem, the women entrepreneur ecosystem, the ag tech ecosystem. So it's very important that we put that thing on front because as soon as you do, you see whole new things and you start seeing what they call the other, that thing which we don't see because we're so focused on innovation, we're so focused on entrepreneurship. But then I put First Nations like, oh, wow. I see all these early support services I wouldn't have thought of. And, and like a lot of the literature says, it starts opening up and saying a lot of the policies that we see in the, in the research that actually helps innovation and entrepreneurship doesn't look anything like it. We can build all the innovation hubs and the incubators and the accelerators, but if I don't address potentially, let's say, childcare or housing or healthcare, I may not get my entrepreneurs, even though I create 10 accelerator programs. So it helps to be very clear around the words we put in and put the boundaries. I've done mapping around creative industries ecosystem. And there's some amazing museums and, and art galleries doing some incredibly innovative things that all of a sudden pop up on the map. Local cultural asset ecosystem mapping. And man, some of the so rich things you see in regional communities that actually mobilize people to come around. And you think, wow, that, that innovation hub is actually happening in that coffee shop. And it gives you something to work with. So that third point is being very clear on the boundaries, on the construct. Fourth. Um, is then what are the objects we're mapping? Again, when giving a mouse a cookie, quite often we look at the actors and the roles and the functions, um, but that does start getting into policy. So the work that we're doing here in Australia is we are looking at uh, not only ecosystem mapping with all the actors, and we've got 4,000 actors across the taxonomy that we're mapping through and keeping track of entries and exits, but we're also starting to get into policy. Policy is absolutely fascinating. I think policy is sexy, which isn't said in very many circles very many times. But the cool thing about it is anytime an institution says we have a vision and we're committing resources to that vision, that's it. But it's a promise, it's a hope in a community to say, here's the direction we want to go. And if we can map that over time, we can see what the direction is and we can help them and encourage them as we then align that to the actual physical infrastructure and the virtual infrastructure we see in that. The five point I'll say then briefly is where to from here. What do we need? So in the work that we're doing in ecosystem mapping across the different sectors, across the different topic areas, um, as we help raise awareness, uh, we need efficiency in this. We need to get um, more people better at doing it with less effort. Um, I, I really push back when people ask me to come in and you know, here's $150,000 to map our ecosystem or this big sum of money, I think, oh, because that can be very extractive. You go in there, you take all the money and you're asking all the people that have all that in-depth knowledge and giving them recommendations and they don't have any funds left to actually do something with it. So how do we then impart the skills on this mapping and create uh, innovation ecosystem cartographers everywhere? <laughs> have somebody as a custodian of that too. Um, then how do we build capacity in those people as a, as a, as a, as a bit of a training system? Three, um, uh, how do we give them some standardization? Um, so even though we are constantly discovering, but have some common terms around innovation hub, incubator, the family of incubators, which includes co-working, hackerspace, makerspaces, and we start creating that, that model. And finally, with that said, we need some interoperability because we will be creating platforms and software. I have a software platform that does it, but there's some great ones out there. There's EcoMaps, there's, there's, you know, Startup Genome has some of that. Deal Room's a great platform. We need interoperability between these so people aren't saying, well, if I do this one, I'm locked into that standard. Let's get the conversations and the data going back and forth. I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. So well stated. Thank you so much. So the three themes uh, that I heard was, uh, being able to take the research uh, findings and make it actionable uh, and make sure that there's enough uh, to show throughput after the research is done that we can actually cure the network and uh, make it a higher performance opportunity. Second thing is a standardization approach uh, with methods uh, that we all agree are common and perhaps even a common language uh, in the way we uh, address it. And then interoperability, allowing full participation of all actors in the network. So thank you so much. Uh, it was great insight. So uh, those of you interested in ecosystems, uh, please um, keep those points in mind when we break out so that we can drill down further uh, on that question. Okay, um, our second uh, presentation will be on inclusion. And uh, this is a broad area uh, that I think is getting a lot of attention. I believe research is lagging in that area and we have a foremost uh, thought leader in that area and Philip Gaskin from the Kauffman Foundation. Uh, Philip, could you share with us uh, your thinking in that area? Thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. Yeah, I think uh, when we talk about inclusion, one of the things that, and I've heard at the conference, um, conferences, this one and others, is something that's universal just across the board when it comes to entrepreneurs uh, being able to be included in entrepreneurship itself. Uh, starting and growing businesses is capital and the issues with accessing uh, capital either at the time of startup, the time of growth. Uh, and so I'm going to uh, talk about our um, recently released Access to Capital for Entrepreneurs report uh, that was released on June 27th of this year um, and give us a, a state of things as it relates to the, to the U.S., but I believe these are things that and issues that are being experienced in countries, in countries around the world. Uh, and the deck that I'll show you today is from that report, which is downloadable off our, off our, off our website. And, you know, as I say, so many people have a, a, a dream or what have you, and it's hard just to make it a, a reality. And the stats that you see at the top, and I'll try to read some of these, although my monitor is way over there and I can't, so I'm probably going to look at this as well, or it's just in case some of these are hard for you to see. Um, at least 90% of people will need at least some form of capital to get started, ultimately leading to quite a few number of um, of businesses in the United States per year. Challenges is this, and we did a report in 2019, our first of these series of reports that show that 83% of entrepreneurs do not access capital at the time of starting or growing a business for a range of reasons, including I don't know where to get capital all the way over to I there's bias in lending and other things. Um, and instead, 65% of those folks are going into personal savings or maxing credit cards or what have you in order to start or go to business. So they're, they're automatically starting um, at, at a deficit. What we did this time in the report, what we hadn't done before, is break it across a number of U.S. demographics uh, in order to show the disparities. And you'll see on every slide that as you do the cross tabs, you'll see that women are impacted the most. Uh, we know some of the stats in venture uh, capital and others it relates to uh, the amount of uh, capital that is going to businesses uh, led, by, led by women. And so this is just the, the breakdown of that as we look at people that are accessing um, uh, personal or family savings it's just more common among those demographics that I, that I just mentioned. And so we find that as being pro problematic because they have fewer resources to draw on to begin with. Um, and as you see there, just compared to some of the other uh, entrepreneurs or households, the disparities that are there for, for a range of reasons. Uh, what we're talking about here is, is, is wealth and wealth creation just as much as we are capital. When, when we have, I believe, and this is, is not our research, but 25% um, of the U.S. Um, population has $10,000 in wealth or less or around that. It just shows you the disparities that are happening in wealth and the wealth gaps and income gaps in the U.S. One of the interesting things there in the middle is that 47% of people just choose not to apply for credit or, or loan or what it may be at the time. And that's for a range of reasons as well, including, and mostly I believe that I'm going to be denied credit or that I've been told that I'm not worthy and or that I just don't know where to find it. I'm not going to go through the process. Um, through our report that we did a few years ago called the Entrepreneurship Levers Report, L-E-A-V-E-R-S, Levers. One of the reasons, why, one of the main reasons why people are leaving entrepreneurship is because those that are around them in their social circles urge them not to go and be an entrepreneur, that it's safer to just not do that or break out from the crowd. So it adds up to a gap that only 44% of businesses report that their finances are actually met. So if that's happening and we have a challenge 
with businesses being started and grown in order to employ more people and order to sustain the economy, you see what the big issue is. And it'd just be interesting to think about this as throughout the world and the countries you come from and looking at, are these stats the same and or different? Uh, and they make good conversational points for you. And this is just breaking down what I mentioned before about uh, just choosing not to apply and what that looks across, what that looks like demographically. And this is breaking down the challenges around the loan process. And so here's where I, we, 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 there have been side-by-side -side blind studies done of two people walking into a bank and having completely different experiences. It took my father four years, four years to get his first loan to open up a convenience store in South Central Los Angeles because of the zip code that we lived in, because of the color of his skin, because of our credit rating system being a little bit odd. And if you have a credit score of just three to four points too low, sorry, you don't get the loans. That, and, and so it, how many people are hearing that others are going through that experience and choosing not to jump in? The application part being too difficult as well. And so those are just some of the things. That's a very long URL, which do not expect you to type. Um, I don't even know why I put it there. But I, I um, w w wanted to, as it relates to research in capital and capital access, understand that it's, it's deep, but it's also very wide, and it's, it's, it's quite integrated. Um, and I would, I would urge that as it relates to inclusion, if the those type of statistics are happening in your regions, the number of people that are not included, do not have a seat at the table, aren't even thought about to be at the table, may be so big that your economies themselves are not thriving. Thank you. This work really goes much deeper than uh, what normally people would think of on the surface. I don't want to put words in, in your mouth, uh, Philip, but the two things I heard were that um, capital availability is not openly and equitably accessible. I think that's the first takeaway. But that wealth attainment and wealth creation is uneven, and therefore it not only suppresses the ability of certain communities to start new ventures, but also it suppresses the economic mobility. So it's an it's a ongoing issue. And then the third element, which I've never thought about, is the fact that credit uh, is not sought by segments of the right. community because they don't feel that they're empowered to leverage that credit. Exactly. Evenly. So it's very, very interesting work there. Thank you so much. Finance. Uh, please feel free to um, uh, continue to uh, drive into that question with Philip in the breakout. All right. Um, the third area that we're uh, looking at is uh, the area of acceleration and incubation, which is probably the oldest uh, literature uh, and probably the most um, picked over literature. But uh, there's still much more to be done. I just was uh, online last night, noticed that Techstars just put out a new class. Uh, an online class on, on the science of acceleration. So uh, who knows? Uh, there's a lot more to be learned. And uh, Chris Haley uh, uh, has forgotten what most people know. So give us a summary, <laughs> Chris. Th th thank you, Ted. Um, so uh, when I was asked to do this, I, I felt a little bit daunted, actually, partly because, as you say, there, there has been so much that has been written in the past few decades in this area, but also because so many of you here in this room have directly contributed to that literature. And I know that I'm going to oversimplify and, and misstate what, you, what, what you've said. Um, <clears throat> but so, uh, oh, oh dear, turn this off somehow. Oh, yeah. uh, so this is what I'm going to try to run through uh, very quickly in the next few minutes, basically summarising what do we know, what do we not know, and in particular, uh, uh, as uh, Ted said earlier, try, trying to think about that bridge. How do we turn this research into useful policy. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it's fairly traditional when you read papers on acceleration incubators to start with a discussion of taxonomy, and th this issue doesn't seem to have gone away. Uh, and I think there are some good reasons for that, um, partly because models are continually evolving and changing, and the definitions that we might have used five or ten years ago simply become out of date because of the way that the space has 
moved. So, for example, in the UK, we find basically that no accelerators are now uh, uh, pure equity based in the way that Y Combinator was. Uh, in fact, very, very few are taking equity. And so hence, we've kind of dropped that from uh, from our definition that we've used and that uh, Tim and the CFE uh, have, have used. Um, one of the other problems I think we have is that we are trying to apply common labels to actually very diverse sets of activities. If you think of accelerators as a bit like schools, you know, it, it's clear that the word school encompasses a very wide range of activity from kindergarten all the way up to college, and we wouldn't expect the types of activities delivered by schools to be the same for, for every type of student, and yet we're kind of trying to do the same for, for accelerators. And I'll, I'll return to that point in a second. Um, that said, you know, there, there is really quite a, a, a voluminous uh, a set of uh, research here, particularly for incubators. We've now got 40 plus years uh, of research around uh, incubators, rather less for accelerators, but both areas have uh, accelerated massively uh, in, in the past few years. Now, having said that, a lot of the research is still quite descriptive. And uh, my own view is that the, uh, uh, the, the quantitative research that we have, a lot of it still doesn't use robust controls. So going back to the levels of evidence that Tom mentioned earlier, um, uh, an awful lot of the research out there isn't doing things like regression discontinuity design or, or, or uh, um, other sort of controlled um, studies. Uh, and, and partly this is a function actually of what the accelerators incubators themselves are doing. So many programs themselves uh, report their impact without actually any, any sense of a, of a sort of strong control. Um, so this is a, uh, a, a, a nice chart that I stole from uh, one of the um, uh, systematic reviews, which I think neatly uh, sort of maps out uh, the space of papers here. So what you can sort of see on the uh, uh, x-axis there is the sort of process of uh, incubation acceleration. And then making the point that there are different layers of impact, uh, from impact on the firm at the bottom to the, the, the incubating organization in the middle, all the way up to the, uh, the ecosystem at the, at the top. And to um, make this a little bit less abstract, the sorts of thing that we uh, now understand is that uh, Dane has been involved in some of this. We, we understand that accelerating incubators help build local connectivity and there are strong links between connectivity and faster growth. We also now have uh, pretty clear evidence for the existence of spillovers of these programs, as to say benefits at an ecosystem level which are not captured purely by the accelerators or the firms that are getting through them and that's typically a classic public policy argument for support of these types of programs. Um, <clears throat> and we're beginning to understand more about what works within the program. So understanding that, uh, that the fit between mentors, mentees, understanding um, that actually the peer dynamics, uh, all of that contributes to making a successful program. Um, it, it tends to be the case that policymakers care more about this bottom right corner because you know, quite understandably, if these things are being publicly funded, which the vast majority are, um, Policymakers want to know that money is actually contributing to the success of the incubatee firms. Uh, and we, we, we do now have some pretty good evidence that these things can have impact. Um, so for accelerators, uh, I mean, in, in, in all of this space, there, there are mixed studies, right? Uh, and that is partly a function of the fact that incubation accelerators are doing different activities. And so it's not particularly surprising that we find that one study might find, for instance, that a, that a program increases R&D and another doesn't, because actually what's happening within the program can be quite different. But nevertheless, if we look at the four uh, largest quant studies uh, of accelerators, all of them find pretty clear, robust evidence of, uh, of impact. For incubators, to be honest, it's a little bit more mixed. So even though the literature is older, and we now have four decades, there is still, uh, I think, sort of mixed picture about, uh, uh, about what contributes to success and, and whether programs really do have positive impact. To a certain degree, though, I actually think it matters less for incubators and accelerators. Now, why do I say that? I say that because if you look at how programs are funded, accelerators tend to be far more funded by public or corporate sponsorship compared to incubators which have a much higher degree 
of um, payment of services, you know, fun funded by, by rent uh, of startups that are in there. And hence, even if the academic base is slightly um, unclear, the market is saying these things are valuable. People wouldn't be paying to uh, occupy space if that weren't the case. Now, <clears throat> I said these things have impact. One of the fundamental points is that impact is multidimensional. Um, so there are lots of different types of outcome um, that uh, incubators and accelerators uh, can drive. And um, you know, just as schools uh, may encourage uh, their students to develop in, in certain ways, so I think we should be thinking that incubators and accelerators would all be uh, pushing towards slightly different directions. And if we try to homogenize that or distill it down to one dimension, I think we will become uh, unstuck. Um, <clears throat> and th this is just a chart from some UK research we did showing the different pathways. So this is sort of where we had pretty strong evidence for a certain type of activity leading to a change within the firm and then some downstream change. Um, but it's quite clearly the case that some accelerators will focus on different activities on the left-hand side, and hence it's not surprising that we see different success outcomes on the right. So that's a sort of a, a brief summary of, of kind of what, what is known. What, what do I think, uh, and this is sort of my personal interpretation, what do I think are some of the big unknown questions out there? So there, I think, are a series of questions around why do we still see variations in effectiveness? Those are interesting, those are important questions, but to my mind, they are less important than the question of cost effectiveness, which frankly, the literature hasn't really addressed uh, in the way that I would like to see it. And, and this, I think, is a crucial question for that, that, that bridging uh, um, uh, activity. How do, how, do we, how do we make this research useful for policymakers? We have to remember that policymakers, if they're interested in supporting startups, interested in supporting entrepreneurs, they will have a suite of tools at their disposal. And they need to understand what tool is the right one for a particular situation. So we, we've got to give them, I think, better evidence for the cost effectiveness and the comparative cost effectiveness of different types of intervention. There are, I think, a separate set of uh, really important questions about economic sustainability. Um, it is very clear that the majority of certain accelerators uh, in the UK need some form of ongoing subsidy. Uh, and I think this is exacerbated by the uh, arrival of, of, of many corporate accelerators. Most accelerators, certainly in the UK, are, are, are now corporate. Sorry, most new accelerators. And I think about 51% of total accelerators are corporate sponsored. Uh, and typically, they're not taking equity. And many entrepreneurs look at them and say, well, there's a zero equity model. There might be an equity model. Um, for, for me, I'm, I'm maybe going to go with the zero equity one because I'm not giving away my company. The other thing, of course, is that uh, some of the leading international programs uh, like Y Combinator uh, are global. They're clearly taking the, 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 the cream of the crop from across the world. Uh, and that makes it even more difficult for any uh, accelerator that has an equity-based model for them to get the return from that because they're losing that, the, the, the real outsized returns that they would expect to get from those leading startups. This, for me, is, I think, a, 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 quite an important question because if we're saying these things need ongoing public support, um, then I think we need, we need to, to, uh, to demonstrate and make that case rather more clearly to policymakers. I think there are some very interesting questions also about the appropriate ecosystem level mix of programs. And this is something that some of my colleagues at Genome have been uh, thinking about, which is to say, for an ecosystem at a given stage of development, what do we think should be the, the, the ideal mix of pre-accelerators, accelerators, generic accelerators, and, and specialized industry ones? And how will that change over time as an ecosystem matures? Uh, it, it seems to me very unlikely that a young ecosystem can support, has, has the necessary deal flow to support many or any, or any specialized industry vertical ones. You might need far more pre-accelerators until you've got the volume of deal flow uh, uh, necessary to support them. Um, just a few more, got, got just a couple more slides and then I'll wrap up. Important question about spillovers. As I said, this is typically a key argument for... Um, Public goods are, are, are a classic argument for public funding, uh, but some important questions about how can we maximize these. When we talk to incubator and accelerator managers, all of them say, well, yes, of course, we know this, this happens, um, but typically these, they see this as incidental to what they are doing. 
And one important question is what would happen if we really made that a deliberate function of these programmes? How would we encourage it? How we measure it? And how can we be sure that this is not simply displacement activity from nearby regions? Um, another set of important questions in my mind about learning effects. So we, we know learning effects are real, that uh, accelerators and incubators have been around for longer, typically do a little bit better. And you might say, well, OK, that means that we should continue funding the, uh, the, the older, more established ones. But then, you know, all of us who care about entrepreneurship know that creative destruction is important. We don't really want to be in the business of supporting incumbents just because they were there first. So how do we balance uh, continuing to maintain learning effects of these programmes with, on the other hand, a desire to sort of see the emergence of new programmes? Uh, and some of those new programmes, by the way, are quite can be quite radical and look quite different. So we see the emergence of things like venture studios, um, programmes like Conception X, which are far more focused on uh, uh, individuals, things like, um, name escapes me now, but there are, there are new programmes in the UK which are starting more from a challenge-based model rather than uh, building on the uh, 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 an existing firm. Um, Monitoring and evaluation, I think we have to get better at providing frameworks and tools for programmes. So we can do uh, uh, in-depth evaluations, um, but they are quite time-consuming, and it is not realistic to expect policymakers to do this all the time. Very pleased to see that uh, LaunchVic has uh, been, been uh, keen to sort of understand what's happening for the programmes that they're sponsoring, but not every, uh, every funder and every policymaker will do that, and the programmes themselves don't have the capacity, so we need to think about how we make that easier. Um, and also, I think there, there are a series of questions about the kind of non-Western context, so the Galley Initiative, which many of you are involved in, has been quite instrumental in trying to gather evidence from um, developing countries, but it still remains the case that the vast majority of, um, uh, of papers relate to the US, uh, the UK, and a, and a handful of Western countries. Um, this is my very final slide. Um, just a sort of few closing thoughts. So how, how are policymakers using the information that's out there? What are we giving them? What do we need to give them? Many, unfortunately, do tend to see incubators and accelerators as a bit of a silver bullet. And I think we should be encouraging policymakers to see them in the context of a much wider entrepreneurial uh, strategy and see this as one tool uh, of, of many and help them understand when it's appropriate to, to use them. Um, I have a few questions about mixed funding models. So it is very common for programmes to receive joint public and private funding. Is that at odds? Uh, is there a tension there? You, you, you might expect that the public funders are particularly interested in local economic regeneration. They want the startups that they are supporting to stay local. But VCs may say, well, actually, the best thing for the startup might be for you to relocate uh, to a different market. Uh, is there a tension there? It doesn't really seem so, but I suspect that might also be because we as a community haven't looked uh, for evidence. Um, point about uh, ongoing public support I've already mentioned. One, one final thought for you as a community. Uh, as, as Ted said, academics will kill for data. Um, it is very often the case that programmes do have data, but they don't have the capacity to analyse it themselves. Uh, academics and other researchers here in the room, we have that capacity, but we often don't have the, the data. And I think there is a mutual advantage to be had if we can bring those communities a bit closer together and uh, uh, use our capability to analyse the data and tell the programmes themselves what, what works and what doesn't work. So a, a final question to, to end on is who should be doing that, that brokering? And if it's not us uh, within the gen community, who, who else should it be? I'll stop there. Thank you. Chris, thank you. That was outstanding. Um, so what I heard uh, was that, um, you know, it's largely been validated uh, acceleration incubation as being helpful uh, in the process. Uh, secondly, that the success hypothesis, now the nature of success is heterogeneous and multidimensional. Uh, the outcome variable is, is not altogether clear. What are we shooting for? What are we aiming for? Uh, how do we measure impact? Um, what are the contributing factors for acceleration success or what are the mechanisms or what we'd call the dependent variables that would influence uh, performance? And then the areas that are unknown, effectiveness, cost effectiveness, sustainability, 
mix and stage of growth, which is fascinating, uh, and all of us are, are attacking that growth stage now, um, the effect of spillovers uh, in all forms, and then I, I think the non-Western context uh, from the Galley studies, uh, I would widen that to say, you know, uh, going after the Silicon Valley paradigm, you know, that it's not useful for um, most of us in the real world. Um, ver you know, more or less focused more on entrepreneur-led economic development strategy. So I hope that was a good summary. Um, so I'm from the University of North Carolina in the U.S. Basketball is a big thing. Uh, four corners is a thing at UNC. We have four corners, which is very helpful. We have three topics, so we're not getting the parity. We should have added a fourth segment. Uh, we're going to ultimately be breaking up into three different breakouts, and I thought maybe the three discussants will be in each corner. But before I release y'all, I thought maybe we'd get the ball rolling uh, and go back to each of the discussants and ask them to, and I'm going a little bit off script, so I want to ask for your apology, uh, ask for your forgiveness. Um, I'd like to ask each discussion, discussant at the top of their mind, how they would score the degree to which our current understanding of your particular topical area is research informed. Or another way to think about it is, what's the maturity of research in your respective area? Chad with ecosystems, Philip in inclusive entrepreneurship, Chris with acceleration incubation. So the scale would be, Research does not inform policy, score is zero. Or research has completely informed uh, policy, score is 10. Something in the middle would be five. And then I would love for each one, after you give your score, I would love to invite everyone here to comment on the presentation and specifically say, what questions do we still have to answer in this area that are on the frontier that we don't know much about? So could I ask uh, Chad to kick us off a score of one to 10, or zero to 10, what would it be? Seven. Seven. Oh, you want me to say more? <laughs> so the, um, well, look, I, I think, like we know, like we, we were comfortable with the concept of an ecosystem, and we talk about ecosystem mapping, and, and we get it, right? But, but now, so what do we do with that? Um, the, the map doesn't, it's really not of any value unless it tells me where I am, where I might need to go, and how I need to get there, right? It's like opening up Google Maps and it's just a map. But that red line that says from here to there and there's a red light camera there. So, so I think we need to add the stuff on the map. I think we also need to get more nuanced about the map of pointing at specific focus areas and, and incorporating inclusivity and, and looking at bias in the map. So we're getting more nuanced. So I think it's great that we're, we actually have, it's much like the ecosystem, like in Australia, um, we have a lot of the assets. We have a lot of the, the species in the ecosystem. Now we're starting to get more specialized, but then how do we connect it together? So I think, you know, depending on where we, we put the maturity scale on that one, um, you know, I, th I think we're, we're going into ecosystem mapping 2.0. We've got the baseline. We now need to get more nuanced and sophisticated to get to that next level. Very good. What questions are out there that have to be addressed in this area of ecosystems? What are the areas that we really need to focus our energies on just to get the conversation started? for the breakouts. Please. Um, yeah, thanks, Chad. I really liked your, um, in your talk, where you talked about the adjectives that need to go in front of these things and that that gives different insights. Um, one observation I have in this general space of ecosystems is that it started with an economic lens. Uh, and I think if we put sustainability inclusion, um, uh, the environment, um, maybe individual well-being, in front of these things that you get different aspects of the, the ecosystems and the maps coming in. And uh, you know, that's one area that I'd like to see it advance in, in, in the coming years. Yeah. There's some great work being done in Korea um, by Kichan Chan uh, on um, the area of, uh, of um, uh, well, inclusionary entrepreneurship, but it's uh, primarily on human humanity, uh, humane entrepreneurship, he calls it. Fascinating. Please. Yeah, uh, in the field of ecosystem, when we are talking about mapping, we are talking about uh, something uh, instrumental, right? But at the, more con at the more conceptual level, we still have uh, some uh, issues we should uh, address. And I would like to know how to cope with that when mapping the lack of heterogeneity of the approach and the critique that address the issue of static. That means the need for evolutionary approach. 
or maybe it's just to recognize the limits of the mapping instrument. Very good. I saw a question over here. So every time I hear the word ecosystem, I always ask the like to see the answer to how we move from ecosystem to ecosystem. And I will mention this part of it is actually a lot of you know funding as maybe I focus on developing country maybe. A lot of funding agency created a lot of buzz and a lot of people jump on this wagon of entrepreneurship where if you do a map, I think maybe we need to do a research on correlation between number of actor and ecosystem and impact. I will say maybe there is not a positive correlation because you get people who just go in there for the sake of funding, not because of what they actually want to do an impact. And I would like to conclude, as they say in the state, where is the beef? A lot of time you see a lot of noises, but in reality, you will see zero impact and sometimes it's negative impact. Thank you. Well said. Well, I'd like to move to the second area. Um, Philip, um, on a score of zero to 10, how, to what degree does um, research inform our understanding of inclusive entrepreneurship? And what commentary would you give? On, on the um, topic that I spoke on, I'd say overall it's a, it's a five, but I'm gonna give it, this is a hybrid five. The research around capital access is, and the issues is, I believe, now sufficient. The inability for um, decision makers to accept it and put that into action is highly insufficient. <laughs> and um, so there's both short-term, mid- and long-term change. Uh, when, I always, always say when we talk about systems change, Systems change, chasing systems change is hard. What's easier is to chase and to encourage folks to change behavior and then make different decisions. And when those decisions are made differently, systems then can, then, then can change. So when we look at traditional lending and, and other, other sectors, the decisions that are gonna have to change um, uh, I, I believe are being informed, but I think there's a trans, perhaps a translation on a connectivity more that needs to happen. So I, I, I sit it in a five from that perspective. Um, happy to take any questions as it relates to Please, that. what commentary and questions in this area? Please. I think um, R is a man from the Commonwealth Businessmen's Center for Conclusion for Institute London. I think when we talk about inclusion, um, I think there's a bit of a link to, Chris, what you were saying when we talk about non-Western contexts. Because for me, it's inclusion. I mean, when, um, when a few hours ago, Jamaica got up to win the award, you know, the kind of Oscar last night, perhaps. There's a reminder, being they're a small state in terms of the Commonwealth countries of 56 countries. They are one of the 33 of those 56 countries that are defined as a small state. They're a small country. And when you talk about inclusion, we talk about different countries and non-Western. We even need to look at that context as well. You know, within the non-Western, you know, what, what is it about a Malta and a Jamaica and a Fiji that enables them to do stuff around this work? So, you know, I think when we talk about inclusion, for me, it's also inclusion of different kinds of countries as well as different kinds of demographies. Oscar. Ted, one thing I would just add is, and I was, I was centering in on, on capital. As it relates to inclusion overall, I'd say three or four. Um, and I think perhaps when we broaden it out, like it was, was raised at the table earlier about in, environment, sustainability, and anything else, so, so that decision makers understand the expanse of the issue and the need for inclusion, perhaps it's more translatable and understandable. Please. Yes, um, I fully agree that inclusion is very important. I come from Latin America, inclusion is a first order problem. But I wonder to what extent, you say that finance is not enough, right? I wonder to what extent we need a systemic approach to address this. Because 
As Ted said, we all want to invite everybody to sit on the table, but maybe there are other problems in other rooms or in the building in general. Right, and that's that's where the whether it be the behavior change, the decision making change. Uh, we're talking social innovation basically when we're talking about inclusion, and so I agree. I agree with you because it's it's in different rooms. It's what discussions are happening in those rooms. What connectivity is there? It's it's, it's quite broad. Please. Thank you very much. I'm Sunday from Nigeria, Africa. Uh, that inclusion, again, is what is ringing in my head, and I've actually been looking at how, when we set some of these parameters, how inclusion, too, can be very fundamental in them. Um, what um, defines um, a startup that is successful in Africa, in, in the U.S., may not really be what would define a startup that is successful in Africa. And you discover a time when, you know, when you talk about capital, you know, especially as Serie A fund and Serie B fund, you discover that it may or may most of the time that some of the VCs or angel investors will be using to may or start up to invest into in Africa. It's not really feasible when you look at the configuration of the society in Africa. So you discover that a very good and smart um, idea that could be moved forward does not receive investment because there are some parameters that is, you know, uh, that have been determined, you know, in the U.S., in the U.K., which probably did not put into consideration some of the factors and the institutional environment in Africa. So I will be very strong in that and be looking at how we look at either we, you know, sessionalize some of these things and Africa, we can be part of the discussion so that at the end of the day, we will be able to communicate it very, you know, um, clearly. In Africa, some of the things that we define, what successes are, what will make, make you to receive, uh, you know, investment and things like that. But again, we want you to put into consideration the institutional environment in Africa. You know, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to minimize the existence of bias in any way, so I hope these comments aren't misconstrued, but it occurs to me that in every country, the ethnic minority is typically the most productive from an entrepreneurial standpoint. And uh, for that reason, we need to celebrate diversity in entrepreneurship because typically it comes from the minority, not from the majority. Um, I can go after one, one after another examples. Good morning. Um, I'm just going to point out the most obvious issue about inclusion today is the army of men uh, who are speaking to us about uh, entrepreneurship research. And you can say it, white men too. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, have, you actually have the, the floor. Please feel free to share. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, the, it was the first thing that struck me, uh, even in the speaker's list, that at an international conference, we are still maintaining the bias of it being very uh, Euro-American-led because it's Americans, uh, there's one person who's American but representing Australia, uh, the UK and the US, and that's the dominant you know, information and perspective that we are uh, utilizing to talk about global entrepreneurship. This is problematic. That's, that's fair, I think that's extraordinarily fair. So thank you for calling it out, that's wonderful. All right. Yeah. Any other white males who'd like to speak? <laughs> I'm just joking. Any other commentary? I don't mean to belittle it. It's probably the most important area, and certainly the area that's least informed. Uh, lastly, Chris and acceleration incubation. So I think it's really it's, it's a difficult question. Um, and it, it, it's difficult for a few reasons, but w when, when I think what, what is the key policy decision that's being made, actually in many cases it is a decision to fund these programs or not, right? And I, and I would say it's probably, if I had to put a number, I'd say three to six, probably higher for incubators and accelerators, mm -hmm. possibly trending downwards in the UK because of the way that we're restructuring some of the funding that is available. Um, on the design side, though, I would say it's probably only one or two. Right. And what I mean by that is I think we do a very bad job of getting this research into the hands of practitioners. So the people are actually running 
incubators and accelerators, I, I think there, there is quite a disconnect. Uh, even, even in the case of academic uh, in incubators, I think there's still a, a, a gap between the people running them and, and the, those people researching them. But that's not to say that the programs themselves are not empirical. Right? So, so I think there, there is a lot of learning and a lot of experimentation within these programs. So the, the people running it are keen to understand what works and to experiment and to constantly iterate with the programs. But they're doing that them, themselves. They're often not taking advantage of what is, what is known by, by the, the academic community. Well said. Well said. Please. Um, uh, so I just wanted to... Sorry, I'd is that we haven't necessarily, uh, we're making an assumption that the objective of them is to produce companies, right? Whereas in actual fact, for a lot of incubators and accelerators, the objective is to have something that was developed by, uh, 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 for a, a political reason uh, or a public policy reason in order to regenerate a downtown area or to have something else to hook it on. And what we don't necessarily track and understand is what the actual motivations were behind something. Or if I've got, you know, the, um, is anybody here from a large corporation? Okay, good. I can't pick somebody and offend them. If you've got like the Ford Motor Company accelerator, right? The objective there is PR or brand. And we don't actually track that. We assume that it's production of companies. Uh, and one of the things that we have that's an issue across all of these interventions is a difficulty in tracking and making comparisons between all these interventions. And it particularly comes into the ecosystem uh, uh, element. And one of the things that, that I actually, Chris and I uh, discussed for years and said at some point, we should think more about is that the European Union had 30 years of funding programs under the structural funds and I acknowledge by the way the previous comment that I've just defaulted to a European version of this uh, a settlement just happens to be where the data is whereby they basically said here's a bunch of money so you know all of that and they compared let's build a building Let's start an accelerator, let's build an incubator, let's build a program to put in leadership. And they used the same evaluation criteria of how many jobs created, how many jobs saved, how many new products launched, how many uh, products saved, for every, how many new, much money raised for every single one of those over 30 years. And so we can, we can do a comparison between an incubator or an accelerator, whatever. Uh, I, 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 15 years ago, I documented in my version of the Atlas about 300 of those. Uh, uh, we never got around to analyzing them. But it gives us in an ecosystem the ability to, to have a comparison between different interventions and to see their efficacy. And I find it, I, 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 uh, it's one of those things that somebody should pick up because I've been saying it for 10 years and I haven't done it. Other commentary in this area? Very good. Well, um, we are very fortunate uh, to have uh, with us today um, uh, uh, Professor Jared Ormston. Uh, uh, professor, uh, you're at the University of Technology, Sydney, and uh, your work is in inter interdisciplinary innovation. And you've heard our scores. Uh, the first score was maybe a seven for ecosystems. Uh, in inclusion, in, in the area uh, that was spoken, in inclusionary finance, uh, maybe a five, but in all areas of inclusion, a two. Uh, and then in uh, the last area, um, incubation acceleration, uh, a six, but in areas of mechanisms, two. Um, I, I would, I'm asking you a pretty tall order from the academic perspective. Uh, how do you feel that we are uh, scoring and serving those three topics? Yeah, thank you. And I think I can yeah, give a bit of a reflection on, on some of the talks and uh, maybe help contribute to the call to action for the, for the discussion afterwards as well today. So thank you for having me here. Um, and I think I'll reflect on, it was, it was one of your comments, Ted, at the start as well about the importance of that sort of policy research nexus. And I think it's a nice time for us to start thinking about what's the role of academia and universities in contributing to this space. In, in this country, in Australia, we've had a huge controversy recently with some of the ways that government is engaging with consultants. And I think this creates a nice opportunity for academic researchers to step in and, and, and provide rigorous research in this space. This is an example um, of some recent research um, that we conducted in collaboration with Louise Gillespie over there in the New South Wales Innovation and Productivity Council and Investment New South Wales on accelerating and incubating 
Um, and I want, I want to emphasize that word linking to what Chad was saying before. You know, we've, we've spent so much time trying to research these entities, these actors, but also the, the connections between them is important and that shift towards the practice lens of what, what's involved in actually incubating, what's involved in actually accelerating organisations, I think is something for us to, to focus on. What we've realised in a lot of the research is that entities might not necessarily, or organisations might not identify as an incubator, as an accelerator, but they're engaging in those practices of accelerating, incubating the economy. So I think we should broaden out that lens there as well. Um, speaking to sort of some of Philip's work, work on the inclusion piece, we've seen this huge growth um, in Australia, in New South Wales, on these different um, types of entrepreneurship support organisations. And as the ecosystem has matured, we start to see this greater focus on equity, diversity, and inclusion. So it's interesting to see why that why that emerges as as the ecosystems become more mature. Just to give a bit of an Australian perspective there, building on some of Chad's work, you can start to see the, the you know, we've got 900 of these entities across Australia and we're starting to see, you know, much more focus on specialised sectors, specialised industries um, and working with specific groups in this whole incubation and acceleration space. A final couple of thoughts. Um, yeah, speaking to some of, of, of Tom's work before on the need for rigorous evidence, um, we see a lot of mixed evidence in this space. Um, Chris was speaking to this as well before. So well, there's a lot of academic studies focus on the impact on the individual entrepreneur, the impact on the startup or of the support organisation itself, but we have very limited data on that system level. And I think that's what my call would be for our discussion today. How can we understand the impact of this broader system of entrepreneurship support. And I think that's what brings together all three conversations is how do we jump away from these sort of pockets and this more fragmented understanding of entrepreneurship support to understand that system level. So this is some of the work that we're doing now, again, in collaboration with the guys at uh, Investment New South Wales and the New South Wales Innovation and Productivity Council. But I think these questions here will help shape the conversation today. And I think it, it links to what Tim was saying before of what's the point of all this stuff? We're throwing all these policy initiatives, we're throwing all these money at supporting entrepreneurship. What's the broader goal of what we're trying to achieve? You know, How are we aiming to shape inclusive entrepreneurial ecosystems? Which industries and sectors are important for a sustainable, flourishing, thriving economy? Um, how are we contributing to a culture of social entrepreneurship? Um, and I think that, that notion of place too is also important. So what can we do from a policy perspective, from a research perspective, to understand that sort of connection to place and that sense of place? But I think this is what I'd encourage people in the conversation day to focus on that system level. We've, as, as Chris showed before, there's been so much research on that level of the impact on the individual entrepreneur, on the startup, but we have a real dearth of understanding of that broader system level impact. Thank you. Terrific, Professor Armiston. <laughs> That's a great call to action for our next segment, which we're going to do as a breakout. And I'm going to ask, we're going to maximize as much time as we have to at least get the conversation started. Uh, again, the four corners, I'm going to ask uh, Philip Gaskin, since you're closest to that corner, you would anchor that corner in inclusion and inclusive entrepreneurship. I'm going to ask uh, Chad if you could uh, anchor that corner uh, in uh, the area of uh, ecosystems. And then Chris, if you could anchor this corner, you're making the longest trip uh, in the area of acceleration and incubation. So you're going to vote with your feet, go to the area that most interests you. Uh, and you're, the, the topic of the conversation is how do we widen the bridge or draw academics into the policy area? So how do we draw researchers into uh, the conversation to improve policy, to improve our score from zero to 10? And then what are the key frontier issues that need to be addressed as a next phase? of our work and research. So um, we'll go for uh, until uh, uh, 11.50. If you could look at, your, uh, look at your watch, we'd like to just conclude at 11.50, so give us about 20 minutes. So if everyone could go ecosystems uh, in that corner. Uh, I'm sorry, acceleration incubation in that corner, ecosystems in this corner, and inclusion up here. And audience, if you want to join, please, uh, feel free to uh, join the breakout.
Um, before we wrap up and depart for next sessions, Ted, we, um, no need to necessarily reconvene, but Ted, do you want to grab a microphone and uh, say a quick closing? Well, for, first off, I just want to say this is the kind of conversation you hate to truncate and conclude because we're just getting in the way of what would be a better conversation. Don't let the conversation end. That's the first point. Secondly, I think we're all hungry. It's, we're not hungry for food or lunch. We're hungry for more. We need to bring researchers and policymakers together. And I believe Matt uh, has built a, a strategy for us to continue this with the next year's uh, GERN. So I'm very excited about the potential direction. I just want to thank you all for giving us the gift of uh, really building a, a framework. Um, one word I, want to, I think is the theme. I just want to credit my, my colleague uh, in this group, intersectionality. The fact that all of these questions have great depth, and we have to bring a wider and more diverse array of people to the table to answer these questions. I'm going to kick it back to my boss, Matt, who will <laughs> kind of tell us what's next. <clears throat> thank you, Ted, and thank you, everyone, for participating. This has been phenomenally insightful, and hopefully these conversations are the start of something more. Um, with Tom and the, the, the Gen Atlas, as you've seen, we've got a phenomenal base to uh, build our insights uh, uh, and uh, start developing really practical working groups that can bring together the researchers, the policymakers, and the practitioners, uh, certainly on these three topics that we've started to discuss today, but hopefully more uh, topics as well. Uh, the conversations that you started today, we would love to pick up. We would love to get your insights afterwards on how you wish to use the network, how you see what you see as the opportunity for the Gen Research Network to continue um, <clears throat> exploring these topics, sharing insights, and collaborating. So we look forward to working with you uh, in the future. If you are not already a, a registered member of the Gen Research Network, please talk to Tom, uh, and we'll get you signed up so you can continue the conversations and be part of uh, our activities going forward. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. And, and, and could I say, I want to thank uh, Chad, uh, Philip, and Chris for putting together a wonderful session. Thank you very much. Let's keep the conversations going. <laughs>